What was the title of the message this morning? Reflecting the Father. So this is part two. Reflecting the Father. Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always unto the end of the world. Amen. We began to explore this morning. We said Jesus was teaching from the word of God. Now we also established this morning that when Jesus was teaching this in Matthew 28, he was not teaching from the book of Matthew. Because there was no book of Matthew in existence, obviously. When he was teaching Matthew 28, he was not teaching from the book of Acts or the book of Ephesians or Colossians or Thessalonians. And this was a teaching service. Jesus was teaching. So obviously, he was teaching from the word of God. And what we mean by the word of God is he was teaching from what we call the Old Testament. He was teaching from Genesis. All right? Genesis to Malachi. We also said that that caption Old Testament and New Testament is not inspired by the Spirit of God. It was the privilege of translators who segmented the Bible into Old Testament and New Testament. It is translators commentaries and Jesus actually taught from the Old Testament. Brother Paul taught from the Old Testament. Peter preached all his sermons from the Old Testament. Testament, And I'm using that Old Testament loosely for the purpose of this teaching. Because what we call the word of God is Genesis to Malachi. In John chapter 1 verse 1, brother John says, In the beginning was the world. In Genesis was the world. And the world was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, verse 3, were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Where? In Genesis. And the light shines in darkness, verse 5, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's not Ephesians, and that's not Romans. He is referring to the scriptures of the prophets or what we call the Old Testament. Jesus, when he was teaching on the way to Emmaus in Luke 24, 25, after the resurrection, he was teaching on the way to Emmaus. And he said to his disciples, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets, observe, his teaching was all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now observe verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. So Jesus called the scriptures Moses and all the prophets. That's the scriptures. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So from Genesis to Malachi is the message of Christ. The message of Christ. Is Jesus the word of God? Huh? Yes. So that means we have the word of God in Genesis to Malachi. We have the word of God in Genesis to Malachi. Because he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And he is the word of God. So, Jesus taught from the word of God. What is the word of God? Genesis to Malachi. Then in Luke chapter 24 verse 44, he now looked at those disciples and said to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written where? In the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. 
open he their understanding dinogio which means he split open for the first time their minds that they might understand tsunami that is he put the facts together and brought meaning out of the scriptures so he opened for the first time their understanding and then the facts were put together for them to see the message of the scriptures so genesis to malachi is the word of god brother peter will put it like this in second peter chapter 1 verse 16 second peter chapter 1 verse 16 for we have not followed cunningly devised fables muthos muthos when we made known unto you the power and coming of our lord jesus christ but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty next verse for he received from god the father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased next verse and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount next verse we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto did you observe prophecy is singular we don't have prophecies the entire bible is the prophecy that means everything the prophet spoke we are tied together as one because they were speaking the same thing. That's why it's called the prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. 20. Knowing this first. That no prophecy is singular. No prophecy of the scripture. So the scriptures have a singular revelation. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private source. Private origin. Prophecy. One singular word, bebio in the Greek, it means fulfillment. A more sure word, he's not doing a comparison as if what we have now is better than what we saw. A more sure word simply means we have the fulfillment of the prophecy. The word more sure means when something is assured. More sure word of prophecy. Words that were spoken by the prophets. And that's the word propheticon. In the Greek, the words of the prophets. Look at that screen Peter, verse 21 of it. Mm -mm. Second Peter, 121. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He says the prophecy of the scripture is the light of God that kept shining in the dark places through the Old Testament. It was the light that shined in the dark. It was the day dawn that arose in the heart. That prophecy of the Christ. He is the day star. He is the light that shines. What has been missing most of the time is the accurate study of that light that shines in the darkness of the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, we have darkness, darkness, darkness. And then there was a singular light that kept shining in the dark until the day dawn arose, which was the incarnation of the Christ. Which was the incarnation, okay? <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 2.15, Brother Paul says, uh, uh, says, study to show yourself the word spudazo, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly, dividing the word of truth. He calls the Old Testament the word of truth, but it requires to be rightly divided. The Old Testament is the word of truth, but it has to be rightly divided. The word ototomio in the Greek ototomio to cut through a part in luke 24 27 he expounded which means you will you have to walk through the interpretation of the scripture 
So the first thing you need to do with the writings of Genesis to Malachi is to understand the language. Understand the language. Then understand the context of the events. Number one, understand the language in the Old Testament. Then number two, understand the context of the events. Those two things are critical. What was going on when the words were said? When you understand that, then you come to your own world. Okay, so we arrive at the concept of interpretation as identification unifiers. Identification unifiers, which means that what happens years ago and what's happening today to see what is common. Identification unifiers. Then discover what is the theology in what was said. What was the theology in what was said? Then apply. What was the theology in what was said? Then apply it. You don't apply it until you understand it. Okay? Now, can I grow spiritually reading Genesis to Malachi? Huh? Yes, because the epistles were written from Genesis to Malachi. All right? Now, we will do some study in the next few weeks in this area because we're looking at something that's very critical. We began to look at the concept of heaven in the first service and I'll encourage you to get the material like I said. And we began to look at the concept of our father as concepts that Moses used in communicating to his audience. Listen carefully everybody. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy were the teaching ministry of Moses. That was Moses' teaching ministry documented. The messages that Moses preached to his audience. And after preaching those messages, they were documented in books for us to see. So when Moses was speaking to his audience and he said to them, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Moses was not talking about the physical heaven and the earth. Moses was using a parable to communicate spiritual realities. Okay? A parable to communicate spiritual realities. And uh, I laid some framework this morning that will help you if you were not here. <clears throat> And I'm just going to continue from where we stopped. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh the son or his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So we said what Jesus was doing was he was communicating to his audience in Matthew using the Old Testament to teach. So when he said, bless those, let's read the pretext. Matthew chapter 5 verse 43. Mm -mm. Matthew 5 43. You have heard that it had been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Next verse. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Next verse. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So Jesus was teaching these from Genesis. So the question will be, where in Genesis do we see that the father blessed those who curse him and did good to those who despitefully use him? Because Jesus teaching this will mean he was taking a cue from the Old Testament. Now what comes to mind, like I close the first service, we'll, we'll explore a lot more later, was a man whose name was Cain and the Bible calls him of the evil one. Cain was of the evil one. He disobeyed God and he held the word of God in contempt. And yet God preserved him. God said, you know, I am going to put a mark on you. 
whosoever touches Cain will pay sevenfold. This is Cain who didn't believe the word of the Lord. This is Cain who held the word of God in contempt. Yet God treated him with goodness, with mercy, and with preservation. And he says, when he said that the mind of the audience Jesus was talking to went to the fact that no revenge as the father. No revenge as the father. All right? And he says, Right from Genesis, God institutes the action of not doing evil for evil from Genesis chapter 4. From Genesis chapter 4 was the institution of God that evil should not be paid for evil. And God illustrated that by his character in how he handled Cain. So God became the founder of no revenge. God became the founder of no evil for evil. And his audience must have seen that as he spoke. But then why do we have hate your enemy in the Bible? And why are those things written in scripture? Is Jesus saying don't obey the scriptures? Because I showed you two scriptures in the Old Testament where he said... You know, he said, evil for evil, don't wish somebody well. And we saw where he says, love. We saw the two. Is there a contradiction? Well, stay with me. He is asking us to read everything. You don't select what you read. You read the whole book. So we read from the beginning. Because when you use the word father, father means one who began something. That's the meaning of the word father. One who began something. One who is an ancestor. A progenitor or a founder. One who began something. One who is an ancestor. A progenitor or a founder. So he says here that he is the founder of good, not evil. That God is the founder of good, not evil. Anytime you want to cause a social media frenzy, just put there very big. God never killed. Everybody will gather there. I know how to get them. God has never killed. Hey! <laughs> because their religious God is a killer. Their religious God is a murderer. Their religious God is wicked. Their religious God is a reflection of the bile inside them. Their religious God is inhuman. Their religious God is a slave driver. Their religious God does not have mercy and forgiveness. Somebody came on my page and said, well, well, how can Dr. Damina say that God does not kill? I speak to all of you that are on this page. Your enemies shall be punished. Then I asked my office to answer him. And supposing you are somebody else's enemy. You know all these people that pray die by fire. And they are praying for their enemies. They are somebody else's enemy. You were God's enemy. Everybody here was God's enemy. If God didn't kill you by fire, then God does not answer die by fire. <laughs> if God answers those stupid prayers, nobody will be alive. If thou should count iniquity, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. It is goodness that leads to repentance. I don't know if they don't read their Bible. They have more faith in Elijah than Jesus. They are not born again. 
They have more faith in Moses than Jesus. They are not born again. They are not our subject. Somebody came on my page and said, Dr. Damina, how can you say Jesus is God? Jesus is not God. That teaching is from the devil. So I asked them to reply him. You are not even a Christian. We have no basis of discourse. You are not even a Christian. So what are we discussing? Have you ever seen light and darkness negotiated? We are, we, so to even answer you is a waste of my time. Because we don't even have, we don't agree. Until you agree that Jesus is God, you are not a Christian. So if you can't come there, we have no meeting point. Our meeting point starts from where me and you agree that Jesus is God. And outside Jesus, there is no God. So if we agree on that, we can travel. But once you don't agree that Jesus is God, there's no basis of this cause. So when people challenge what you believe, the first question you should always ask them to avoid wasting your precious energy and time is that, okay, I've had your question. Let's see if we have a meeting point to start this journey. Do you believe that Jesus is God and that outside Jesus there is no God elsewhere? If he says no, tell him then we can't even answer that question. Because the first meeting point, we have no connection. And once a man does not believe that Jesus is God, your arguments have no end. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So you're wasting your energy. He has to come to agree that Jesus is God Almighty. Uh -huh. Then when he agrees that Jesus is God Almighty, then we can now begin to examine the issue. Did Jesus kill anybody? No. When he walked the face of the earth, did he kill anybody? Did he destroy anybody? Did he remove anybody's eye? No. Which means Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he never did it when he was on earth for 33 years, it means he never did it in the Old Testament and he will never do it. He says, I am the Lord, I change it not. So if Jesus never killed anybody, why are you praying that he should kill your enemy? He won't answer that prayer. It's a foolish, stupid illiterate prayer. I'm teaching good. God is the founder of no revenge. Hey. You didn't hear that. God is the founder of no revenge. God is the founder of no evil for evil. His audience must have seen that as he spoke. But then, why do we have hate your enemy? Why are those things written in scripture? Jesus is asking us to read everything together. Because when you use the word father, you mean someone who began something. An ancestor, a progenitor, a founder. So he says here that he is the founder of good and not evil. He is the founder of the blessing and not the cause. God is the founder of the blessing and not the cause. He is the founder of love and not enmity. Jesus is teaching from Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 which makes those statements and the audience understood what he was communicating. When when then, why then do you have hate your enemy? Go to Matthew 19. Let's track it. The same seeming con contradiction or counter statement comes up in this conversation. Matthew chapter 19 from verse 3. Please follow the reading carefully. Matthew 19, 3. And we're going to read to verse 7. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Next verse. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which met them at the beginning made them male and female? Next verse. 
and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Next verse. Wherefore, they are no more twin but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. Next verse. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? If God's plan was no divorce, Moses is a prophet of God. Why did Moses permit divorce? Is there a contradiction between God and Moses? Moses say hate. God say love and hate not. God say no divorce. Moses say divorce. Is there a contradiction? They were asking Jesus. So, Jesus moves to Genesis chapter 2, which is older than Moses. Because Moses was born in Exodus chapter 2. So Jesus went to Genesis chapter 2. And they said, why? Look at verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses. Now stop. Look at me. He saith unto them, Moses. Pause there. Pause there. I'm coming back. In other words, Jesus quotes Genesis chapter 2. What God has joined together, so shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. They are quoting Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. Jesus is quoting Genesis chapter 2. Jesus is quoting Genesis 2. They are quoting Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. And oftentimes that happens in Bible study. Listen carefully everybody. You forget that you don't jump to Deuteronomy without reading numbers. You don't read numbers without reading Leviticus. You don't read Leviticus without reading Exodus. You don't read Exodus without reading Genesis. The books of the Bible are such arranged so that you read them in their sequence. You don't go to Deuteronomy if you have not read Genesis because you'll be confused. Something happened in Numbers that made a reason for a second law. The second law was Deuteronomy. There was Exodus. Leviticus, then something went wrong in Numbers. And because of what happened in Numbers, another law was given in Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is the book of the second law. Now, wait, 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 wait. Numbers has Leviticus, and Leviticus has Exodus, Exodus has Genesis. Before Genesis 3, we have said there is Genesis 2. And before Genesis 2, we have said there is Genesis 1. You don't read Genesis 3 before you read Genesis 1. You read 1, you read 2 to understand 3. There's a sequence of thoughts. And there's a sequence of understanding. So, observe. You read the Bible into each order. Before you get to Genesis 12, where God called Abraham to make a people for him. We have Genesis 11, where people built a tower to make a name for themselves. Before Genesis 12, where God called Abraham to make a nation for him. You have Genesis 11 where they built a tower to make a name for themselves. So you see that one issue corrects the other. So you must read the scriptures intelligently. Don't pick Deuteronomy without reading Numbers. They wanted Deuteronomy 24. Jesus said, no, don't be smart. Let's start from Genesis 2. We can't hang ourselves in Deuteronomy 24. Let's go to the very foundation, Genesis chapter 2. Like the devil quoted Psalm 91. He said to Jesus, it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you 
to keep you in all your ways, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That is Psalm 91. Then Jesus said to the devil, before Psalm 91, there was Deuteronomy chapter 6, which says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You should have read that first to know that you shouldn't quote for me Psalm 91. Because you can't be quoting Psalm 91 when you have not understood Deuteronomy chapter 6. There's a sequence of thoughts in scripture. Which means Jesus has asked us to read scriptures contextually. He read it systematically. Don't start from Deuteronomy. Start from Genesis. Something happened in Genesis. Exodus. Leviticus. Numbers. Before what was said, was said. Moses said, you can put away your wife. Jesus said, yes. Why did Moses say that in Deuteronomy? Look at Matthew 19, 8. See Jesus' response. Matthew 19, verse 8. Matthew 19. I mean, 9. Okay, 19, verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because... In view of, in view of sclerocardian, Moses, in view of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, it was not so. So, Deuteronomy, where Moses permitted you to put away your wives, was not God. Moses only granted you your heart's desire. God said, don't put away. Moses saw that whether he permitted you or not, you will still put away your wife. So he, he brought protocol. Moses gave you a protocol that you will use in putting away your wife decently. Whether he gave you the law or not, you will have done it because your heart is hardened. Moses only gave you an organized way of doing it. That's what Jesus was saying. It wasn't God that gave you permission to put away your wives. It was the hardness of your heart. You know? <laughs> uh, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is where we see what God does. Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. That's where we see what God does. Then we will see man's actions and inactions. Man's disobedience and God walking through the disobedience, the actions, the inactions God is walking through. Man has decided to resist God. God cannot force man. God can force man. But God loves man. So because God loves man and God can force man, so God cannot push man. So what God does is to walk within the circumstances that man gives him allowance and within it try to be as good as possible towards man. Per adventure, he may persuade man to have a change of mind. So God walking through the circumstances doesn't mean that is his perfect will. It just means that because he loves man, he can't abandon man. So even though man has rejected him, he still comes around with love to see, can I be of any help? The circumstances are not perfect. But God has to navigate through to still bring out his love for man. That's what we see. So God is walking through imperfect circumstances to perfect his plan. Hmm. God said to Israel in Exodus 19 verse 6, I want to make you a nation of kings and priests. They say we don't want. We don't want. Then Moses said, when you get to a point where you're going to have to want to have kings like other nations. Even though God doesn't want you to have kings like other nations. He wants to rule over you directly. But if you get to that point. 
Remember, remember. Despite the fact that God doesn't want you, it's not his will for you. Moses said it's still okay since that's what you want. But whenever you choose to have that king, make sure he doesn't have causes to take you back to Egypt. Make sure he does not multiply gold or wives. Make sure he doesn't worship idols. Why will God give instruction when it is not his will? It wasn't God talking. This was Moses. Their leader who also loves them. Saying, okay, in the midst of two evils, let's look for the lesser evil. Are we teaching here? Yeah. You've rejected God. You don't want God. You've said no to God. Me, Moses, I'm a prophet of God. I represent God and I represent you. So since you have said no to God completely, let me look what you have. Your options are two evils. Of the two evils, this is lesser. Because the consequences that will come from this lesser one will be lesser consequences than the other one. So because I am your leader and I love you, let's go with this. It's not God giving them the option. It is Moses reasoning with them within the circumstances available to see what works better. I'm teaching here. The devil's alternative. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, they did it. They came to Samuel. We want a king like other nations. And Samuel chose a king for them. Again in Numbers, God told them to go to Canaan. They said to God, we are not going to go. We will send spies first. They doubted God. And out of unbelief, they sent spies. Who brought them a report that defeated them? It was in God. Sometimes we see God left, left. With no choice. That God has to walk within the hardness of men's hearts. And see what he can do with it. These were things they were already doing. So God simply just walked through them. God just walked within the circumstances they allowed. So what we are seeing is not God endorsing it, but God accommodating it. God is not endorsing it, but God is accommodating it. Because he loves until they are able to do his word and his will. But we see God's will and purpose. God walking through man's disobedience and man's will. So it's not a contradiction with God. It's a contradiction with man. The contradiction is with man. Because the hardness of the heart is with man. And it is man that rejected God's ways. So the contradiction is among men, not with God. Because what God said from the beginning is what God maintained till tomorrow. He has never changed. But because God has to deal with men, when men reject what God said, then men will carve out their own ways and God will accommodate them because he loves them in a bit to see per adventure they may change their mind and walk in his plan. Am I teaching? Please give me your attention because the, the, the things we are teaching here is revelation knowledge. So it requires a lot of, 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 of reasoning and a lot of praying to be able to see where we're going. Otherwise, the, the kind of things we are teaching here, if, you, if, you, if your eyes are not yet open, you will just be looking at us and thinking we are not speaking English anymore. Is it not true? That's why when people can't understand where we're talking from, they just say, Dr. Damina is a heretic. It's heresy. <laughs> it's illiteracy. It's illiteracy that has made you to label me a heretic. And I'm not bothered with those labels because knowledge does not bow to illiteracy. And that's why we pray in the spirit a lot here. So you have understanding. So if we're on the same page to this point, can I have a powerful amen? amen? So it's not a contradiction with God, it's a contradiction with men. 
Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you. Not God, Moses. Moses, seeing the hardness of your heart, simply wrote out what was there. So Moses is not telling you to do this as if you were not already doing it. Moses only allowed you to display what you are doing already. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. They asked for a king. They wanted Samuel. God gave them Saul. I mean Saul. God gave them Saul to show you God's kindness and goodness and faithfulness. It's not a will but he will find a way around it. It's not his will, but he will find a way. Then we found David, the king, who called God the king. A man after God's heart. So what Jesus is saying here is not a contradiction of God. He is simply saying the contradiction is in the heart of a sinful man. But from the beginning, it was not so. A loving God had to walk with a hard-hearted man. Had to walk with a hardened man. A loving God had to walk with a disobedient man. That shows you that the concept people have of God's sovereignty and control is totally wrong. That God just controls people. Sometimes that reflects in how people pray. Because they think God is a controller general, like customs. So God can just say, Eric, whether you like it or not, you must preach the gospel. And if you don't, I will destroy your business, I will scatter your prosperity, I will punish you with poverty till you preach the gospel. I am the Lord. How many of you know there are people, even in a choir bomb, they believe it. So they will look at somebody and say, you have a call. And if you don't obey the God, call, God will punish you. Then gradually, circumstances will hit a man. Things are not working. He's hard to go to the call. The call. The call. But I don't want to answer the call. But poverty is punishing me. Then they come... Uh, Dr. Damina, is it true that if I don't answer a call, that's why I'm suffering like this? No. But I'm suffering. They told me, and my reality agrees. So the Bible cannot be right. It's my situation and what the man told me that is right. That's the way many of you think. You use your circumstances to check whether the Bible is wrong. But your circumstances are not enough to checkmate the Bible. It's the Bible that should be checkmating your circumstances. How can God punish you for not answering a call? How many sinners are he punished for not being born again? They are in the plane flying and they say there is no God and he does not allow their plane crash. They still land well and get more deals and make more money and live well. That's my father. And because people think of the sovereignty of God in this light, that's why they pray like, in the name of Jesus, whether you like it or not, you must marry me. Father, he must marry me. I cut him off from any girl. Any girl that want to see him, blindness, 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 blindness. You must marry me. You must marry me. Anywhere you enter, I command fire to pursue you. You must marry me. Those prayers are coming from a mindset that does not understand God. God doesn't behave like that. That's a native doctor you are operating with. God doesn't force. If God is going to force people, is it to marry you? He will be forcing people for. He will be forcing people to be born again. His plan is to have everybody to be saved. Yet, he's not forcing anybody. You didn't come here by force. You came here by choice. You heard me preach. The message made sense to you. You got blessed by what you had. And because you like what you were hearing, you were getting 
to, you know, feeling at home with the understanding. And it was affecting your lifestyle without effort. Suddenly you found out that by listening to me, your life is getting better. Things you're struggling with in your life, you're no more struggling with them. So the message must have an impact. And because of that, you came to hear more. So God didn't force you. God only wooed you with his goodness and drew you close to him. That's the way God works. He never forces. So when you are praying and asking God, force him, force him. Father, break his heart. Break his heart. You are doing witchcraft. That's not God. My God doesn't force people. My God woos people, loves people. And then when he discovers you are getting more hardened, he will throw goodness on you. Boom. Throw goodness on you. Boom. You'll be overwhelmed with goodness. That you begin to say, what have I done to deserve this? What have I done? I'm a bad person. I'm a wicked person. Yet good things are happening to me. Oh God. You'll be forced to say, oh God. Oh God, have mercy on me. The goodness of God is what brings men to repentance. God cannot punish you for not preaching the gospel. Instead, he will bless you and make life too good and comfortable that you say, what can I do to say thank you to God? Let me preach. Many people don't know God. God is not like your uncle in the village or your father in the house who says if you don't pass exam, he will not take you on vacation. So you have to go and if you are not passing, you bribe the teacher to give you extra marks so you can go on vacation. God is not like that. Don't use the eyes of your biological father to see God. That's why Jesus had to come on the earth to introduce God as different from men. We saw it in the first service. If you that are evil compared to God know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Much more, much more, much more. I know I'm teaching good this service. Lord, make him obey. Lord, make him obey. God doesn't behave like that. God led them through the Red Sea. They appointed Aaron. They created idols. After 40 years, they were still saying, let us go back to Egypt. Can you imagine? 40 years of God's goodness. Yet, they want to go back to Egypt for cucumber and onions. What is in onion? Apart from making you cry. The fastest way to cry is onions. You are a movie actor and you can't cry. Take a, a little onion in your pocket. When it's time for you to act crying part, squeeze the onion into your eye. You will cry the cry of cry. <laughs> onions. And yet they are dying for onions. They are in the bush. Their shoes are growing. No old. Their clothes are new. They want manna, manna comes. They want water, water comes. Everything is working for them. The weather is cold, God gives them fire. The weather is hot, God gives them cooler. I mean, what else do you want? They still ask, you know, uh, 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 we want to go back to Egypt. We have changed our mind. We want to go back to Egypt. Moses, what is it now? What is it? They say, you are a stupid man, Moses. And you know, when, when they are angry with Moses, they carry stones. So when Moses wrote for them that if somebody does wrong, stone him. It was not originated by Moses. It was what they were used to doing. Moses only regulated it. Don't be stoning everything. Only stone in this and in this and in this. <laughs> I don't know if I'm teaching good here. Moses was just regulating with the laws so that at least things won't be too bad. It was the devil's alternative. Are we still here? So when they read these things in the Old Testament, it's because of the hardness of their heart. And this is God. The God of light. The God of light. He had to walk with it gradually till he comes where he is. Has to send his son Jesus. So you will see the Bible written in a progressive way. Waiting through inefficient and different vessels to arrive at God's ultimate plan. So when Jesus says, be like your heavenly father, he is saying, what Moses said, be ye holy as God is holy. Because they had a lot of idols. So God is saying, be different. I am different. You also be different. Be like me. Be like your heavenly father. In the spirit. 
The spirit of God hovering over darkness. God said, let there be light. So Jesus here is referring to God in the Old Testament. Who had to love the just and the unjust. Which includes Israel. The disobedient nation of Israel. Which also included Abel and Cain. Cain the wicked one. So now. Uh, I've just arrived at what I wanted to teach. So I will, sh I will drop it. Then we continue in the next service. Matthew 6, 9 to 13. But are you learning? After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next verse, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Observe. Give us this day our daily bread. We have converted that verse to houses and cars. Somebody said that verse is provision. Provision. No, that's a figure of speech. Daily bread. He's not talking of cars and houses and amala and pounded yam and nandos. The word daily bread is the Greek word epos, eposios. E-P-O-U-S-I-O-S. -O -O you can write down E-P-O-U-S-I-O-S. -O -O daily bread. It means the next day. The next day. Give us the bread of the coming day. That's what it means. Give us the bread of the coming day. You'll see it in Luke 11 verse 3. Epausios. is derived from another Greek word, epiriv. E-P-I-R-E-V. That is found in Romans chapter 3 verse 3 for further studies. It means seen. The bread that you can see. Daily bread. The bread, the coming bread. The coming bread that you can see. It's a figure of speech. It's, it's the word epiosa. E-P-I-O-U-S-A. A word that explains these words. Now write down these scriptures. You can read them at home. Acts 7.26. Next day. Acts 7 26. Acts 16 11, The next day. Acts 20 15. Acts 20 18. Acts 23 11, The next day. It means the coming day. Give us the bread of the coming day. What was coming? Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. So give us the bread of thy kingdom which is coming. Are you catching? <laughs> so give us the bread of your coming kingdom. Why will he use the word bread? Because he is reading from the Old Testament. Where is bread in the Old Testament? Dethrone your enemies, chapter 8, verse 3. Detron on me. Don't mind me. I'm just joking. Detron on me. Oh, in those days, that's what we used to call detron on me. Detron your enemies. Detron on me, chapter 8, verse 3. Put it up. <laughs> Put it up for me. Detron on me, 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. Manna. Which thou knowest not. Neither did thy fathers know. That he may make thee know that man doth not live by bread only. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now, so manna means a miracle. A miracle of food. In the Hebrew, manna is a question. What is this? Manna. 
what is this? You can take down the scriptures to read at home. Exodus 15, 15. Exodus 31, 35. Numbers 11, 6, 7, and 9. Numbers 11, 6, 7, and 9. Deuteronomy 8, 16. Psalm 78, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 12. It means what or why. Waiting. Genesis 2.19 and Genesis 3.13. I mean 2.13. Then Genesis chapter 4 verse 6 and Genesis chapter 4 verse 10. Which means manna was a redool. Psalm 78 verse 2. It says from the foundation of the world, the word of God was seen as a redool. Redo, redo, redo. Uh -huh. The word, bre the word, word there, word is in italics. So it will be from every that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not from every word, from every that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So manna was given to them as food. So they can see that the word of God is food. So, manna is symbolic of the word of God, which is the food of the spirit. So, they can see not to live by food, physical sustenance, but by every word of God. What is the word of God in Deuteronomy? The word of God is the promise of eternal life. The word of God is the promise of the spirit. The word of God is the promise of that land. The word of God is the promise of salvation and deliverance. Proverbs 30 verse 8. Proverbs 30 verse number 8. Proverbs 30 verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient. Food convenient for me. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, which means what was G when Jesus was praying that prayer, he was saying, give us that bread of the next day. The bread of your coming kingdom. That bread of the promise you made to Abraham. That bread of the coming kingdom. He's not talking about food because he said, man shall not live by bread. But by the word of God. Or you put it like this. Man shall live by God's promise. So that format of prayer. Is a prayer of the kingdom. Is a prayer. That acknowledges what God promised to do. In the old testament. The promise of deliverance. The promise of salvation. The promise of the redemption. The promise of eternal life. This is not a promise for clothes and houses and cars. He has already said that men give to their children good things like car, house, land, money, food, clothes. He already told you that men give that. But what the heavenly father gives is the kingdom. Or let's say it like this. What the heavenly father gives is the spirit. The father doesn't give house, houses and lands. Men give that. The father gives of his spirit. Are you here? So Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. Put it up for me quickly. Exodus 20. And God spake all these words saying, next verse, I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Next verse. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now come to verse 11. You can read the rest at home. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all in the, that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. The Sabbath where you do no work, you only remember what God promised to do. The Sabbath. 
And today, many people who do not read the Bible carefully has decided that Saturday is the Sabbath. But when God was talking to them about Sabbath, he was not talking about a day, he was talking about a person. Using a day to symbolize a person. When Jesus came, the Sabbath came. Come on to me, I will give you what is Sabbath, rest. So the day you entered Christ, you entered Sabbath. Sabbath is not a day, it's a person. In Christ, every day is Sabbath. You can worship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any day you like. There's no more day because Jesus is the day. So that Sabbath, you only remember what God promised to do. Then verse 12 to 18 of that Exodus, he began to say, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not defraud your neighbor. Now Moses is saying, you won't live by bread. You will only live by what God said. The bread of the next day or the bread of the promised land. So in that prayer, what is Jesus talking about? Your kingdom will come. Your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And what happens? You give us, you give us this day the bread of the next day. The bread of your coming kingdom. Clearly, the bread of your resurrection. The bread of your resurrection. So look at what the bread does. Matthew 6, 12. Hallelujah. And forgive us our debts. That's what the bread does. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The way it sounds is as if if you don't forgive people, God cannot forgive you. Now that cannot be true. So there is a translation issue there. Because if he is father, if he is the example that we follow, he can be copying us to do his. He will say, forgive that I may forgive. Rather, it will be I forgive so that you can forgive. Hallelujah. I forgive Okay, let me ask you. Is unforgiveness a sin? Hello? Is unforgiveness a sin? So if I do not forgive, I'm in sin, right? Then God does not forgive. God also is in sin because I'm in sin. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? So there's a translation issue. If you check the original, what he has in the original is, you forgive so that we from your example can forgive others. That's the original. It's old English, King James. Because the prayer is your will be done on earth amongst men as it is. So we are copying what we see in heaven to replicate on earth. So when heaven forgives, we learn forgiveness from heaven and we too on earth, we give forgiveness. Are we here? Which means when this prayer is answered, we begin to reflect the heavenly father. So his will on earth amongst men is done as it is in heaven. So when he says forgive us our debts as we the proper Greek is forgive us our debts so we can forgive our debtors. That is, you are the example of what we do. When we do this, your kingdom has come. When we start forgiving people the way you forgive, that is the reality of your resurrection. The father is not the follower. The father is the example. So there's wrong, something wrong with that interpretation. The word father from the Greek is the word pata. Pata means originator or the progenitor. Progenitor, which means that he is the one that originates love. He is the one that originates forgiveness. He is the origin of it. He is the very root and beginning of love. He is the root of forgiveness. And is the root of blessing those that do you wrong. So that's why he said, be therefore perfect and holy or loving as your heavenly father is. So who is the example? The son or the father? The father. 
So who models the other person? The son. What is the bread of the next day? Huh? The resurrection. The bread of the next day. Is the resurrection. The coming kingdom. And we model the heavenly father in the resurrection. Hello, hello. We model what? The heavenly father where? In the resurrection. Because it is in the resurrection we become sons. So as sons in the resurrection, who do we copy? The heavenly father. What does the heavenly father do in the resurrection? He forgives. What do we do in the resurrection? We forgive. What does the father do in the resurrection? He loves. What do we do in the resurrection? We love. So what do we do? We copy what the father copies. So what's the, that prayer called the Lord's prayer? What is it? A revelation of God's character that we're supposed to reflect. You forgive that we may forgive. You lead us not into temptation because you deliver us from evil. You lead us not into Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. You lead us not into temptation. Why? You deliver us from evil. He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and translated us to the kingdom of his dear son. We don't model disobedient Israel. Moses dealt with them because of the hardness of their heart. We model the father. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So why do we forgive? We forgive because the father forgives. Why do we love? We love because the father loves. Amen. Why do we not revenge? We do not revenge because the father does not revenge. Are we here? Our father is the model. We copy him and we reproduce him. So when things happen, you ask yourself, what will the father do? How will the father handle this matter? How will the father respond? That's how we respond. Amen? Somebody cheats you, you ask yourself, how will the father handle this? How will the father handle this? The father will forgive. I forgive. Sometimes it's not easy. But it's easy for you. It's only not easy for people with a hardened heart. But it's easy for you because that's your nature. Say with me very loud, I'm just like my father. I copy my father. He forgives, I forgive. He blesses, I bless. He prays for those who are very uncaring. I also pray for those. Who want to take advantage of me? I didn't hear a good amen. amen. Get on your feet and shout, I'm just like my father. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, I am just like my father. I forgive him like my father. I love like my father. And I pray for those who need my prayer like my father. Now shout it very loud, I do not revenge. I'm like my father. Are you blessed this afternoon? So when people are praying the Lord's Prayer, you shouldn't be seeing a prayer. You should be seeing the character of your father that has been fulfilled in Christ that you are supposed to reflect. Is it clear? Amen. Lift your right hands, Father. We thank you for the privilege of preaching, teaching, and bringing clarity from your word. Your word is life. Your word is spirit. We're built up. We're edified. Now I decree that this reality overtakes our thoughts, overtakes our hearts, this reality establishes us in what Christ has made available to us in the resurrection. And I decree right now, whatever is contrary is terminated. Thank you for victory on every side. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer shouts that amen on a note of finality. Go ahead, let's celebrate the Father in this service. When I say celebrate the Father, I mean celebrate the Father. Glory! What did the father do? He commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the father. The father forgives even when there is no reason to forgive. I'm just like my father. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Amen. Today is partnership service and I want to thank all partners and friends. Please stand with me. I want to thank all partners and friends all over the world who have always supported this ministry. 
through your partnership, you have helped us to reach the nations of the earth with the gospel. Your giving makes a difference. Every time you partner with us every month, you're able to help us meet up with all the budget and the bills to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I want to thank all of you. I do not take your partnership lightly. And today I want to ask people who have not yet partnered to consider partnering with us. Just imagine this good word being available everywhere human beings are on earth. Imagine what transformation will happen all over the world. It is possible. It is very possible. If all of us together can unite our resources and push the gospel out there. And that's what partnership is about. Where you take a portion of your monthly income to support what we do in this vision of reaching the world with the true revelation of the gospel of Christ. So partners, thank you. And those of you that are yet to be partners that are considering being partners from this month. All you need to do right now is shoot a mail to me. Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and I will make sure all the banking details are sent to you with other partnership information. But all the partners that have always partnered with us, we want to thank you. And I want to also mention that as a partner, especially those of you who always partner through, you know, different nations in different campuses around the world, always make sure that when you send us your partnership commitment, you shoot a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com indicating you have done your partnership commitments because I always make sure a letter is sent from my office to you, thanking you and a prayer for you in that letter. That's also the way you get to know that your money got to us. So always make sure you shoot us an email or just shoot us the proof of payment of your partnership and you will always hear from me. And why I'm saying this is because some people have complained that they're sending their partnership, they don't know if we received it. And some of them, when we check where they sent it to, it didn't come to us. So, make sure that you don't send your partnership to any account outside the account that is scrolling on television, on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and all the various platforms that we use. Don't send your partnership commitment to this ministry to any account outside of those accounts so that nobody takes advantage of you and waste your money for you and defeat the purpose for which you are giving to support this vision. Always make sure you send it to those accounts and when you do, shoot a mail to Dr. Abel Damina indicating that you've sent your partnership commitment. That way we're able to know between us that you got it through to where it is supposed to get to and we send you a letter thanking you and appreciating your commitment to this ministry. Please, this is very important for all the onlineers and for those in all our campuses all over the earth. Those of you in church, you already know that when you redeem your partnership, the banking details are there. And if you bring it to the office, they give you a receipt to acknowledge receipt, receipt, receipt of what you have paid as partnership. And, you know, that, that comes to the ministry. So we're able to do what we do. Please don't, don't take that instruction lightly. It's important and very important. So today I want to pray for all the partners all over the world, including new partners who are joining the partnership. You know, we wanted to know we're so grateful. Father, we pray for all partners all over the world. Every man, woman, boy, girl, child that always partners with us. All our various campuses all over the world that partners with us to ensure that this gospel gets to the ends of the earth. I pray that your needs are met, your desires are granted, and the blessing is upon you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. I also want to mention that today we are challenging people to give for our social media campaign. And I want to thank those of you that have started sending in your commitment for social media campaign. July is 30 days of Glory Bible School and all that event happening. We want to make sure that the, the social media is totally overtaken with the teaching of God's word. So we want people to support our social media campaign. Some of you can give us $100, $50, $500, $200, $1,000 according to your financial ability. You know, but I, I really want you to support our social media campaign. It takes a lot of money to push things through the social media and get it into everybody's face. It takes a lot of money. So I want to ask you to help us. You know, those of you that want to give online, just reach me with an email, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Indicate that you want to support social media campaign. We will send you banking details, the account where the money is supposed to go to for social media campaign. And I want to thank you 
for responding and making your resources available. Somebody did for you to hear. When you do, somebody else will hear what God is doing in this place. Can I have a powerful amen? Jael, please come. You were talking to me. Jael just walked up to me within the week. Can I have a mic? Okay, you can use my mic. He just walked up to my office. I was studying. Her mother was sitting with me in the office. And she said, Daddy, we need to get this gospel to the ends of the earth. And she spoke with such, you know, such passion. And I wanted to just share with us why she said what she said. Good afternoon, church. So a few days ago, I saw this video of a man who was sharing his childhood story of how when he was like five years old or six years old, his mother moved him and his family to a city to be part of a church. And this church was led by a man who basically believed that demons were among everyone on earth and you know there's only one church everyone else would go to hell and you know you have to protect your mind from these demons so you wouldn't be possessed so they moved to this city to be part of the church and basically the church believed that if you're overweight you were possessed by a demon of gluttony if you were if you were a guy and you had feminine mannerisms you were possessed by a gay spirit just ridiculous things like that so this boy, five years old, he had feminine mannerisms. So they said he was possessed by a gay demon. And his parents believed it completely. So they pushed him away from society, kept him on his own. And when, after a few months of trying to exercise the demon, they said that this demon was too strong. And so he needed to be taken to a special camp where they would beat out the demon. So they tortured him, they beat him, poured water. They did so many things to him. So he's telling this story and he's like many years later telling it to his children and his wife and he's like in his 50s and he's saying that he's still getting therapy for such a traumatic incident because he still believes that it was his fault that he was possessed, in quote, by the, the gay demon. And so when I watched this video, it just, it was scary, it was enlightening because then I realized that people actually go through such horrendous things in this world because they meet such fake people who preach the fake gospel in the name of, oh, you know, you need to be saved or else you go to hell. And it just made me so angry that such people can't actually have access to the real gospel. And which is why I went to my dad to say what I said, you know, because it's, it made me realize that it's so easy when you're in such a loving environment filled with people who actually know the gospel, you tend to forget the other people who aren't in such an environment like we are, aren't experiencing and gaining what we are gaining. They're actually suffering. It makes you forget how scary life is without God, without hearing the gospel. Life is horrible, hell on earth for so many people, which made me realize how important it is that the gospel should be spread across the world very quickly. Because such people, if, you finally, if they finally meet someone who's preaching the actual gospel, they wouldn't want to hear it because of their past experience. If you go to them and you say God loves them, they'll be like, why didn't he protect me from what I went through? Or why are you saying such things? I don't believe you. So it makes our work double because then we have to take time and spend more time with them, breaking down what they've heard, erasing it from their minds. So we need to reach so many people first before anyone else can reach them with the fake gospel because it's so, so important. Because when I watched that video, it just made me realize that how sheltered I am because I, my dad is a pastor. He's preaching the right thing. You know, I'm in a church. Everyone knows the right thing. We're loving. We're, we care for each other. We're kind. So many people don't experience that. So many people are suffering. They're going through so much pain and turmoil in their everyday lives from their families, people who are supposed to protect them, all because of the fake gospel that people are spreading. Ignorant people are spreading. Ignorance is so evil. It's so wicked. It deprives you of love, of the things that God wants you to have. So it's very important when you're asked to give here in church, you should give. Because even though you might not be able to go out and evangelize yourself, your money goes for you. Even if you can't go out, your money still goes further than you could ever go, faster than you could ever go. Because you might be able to go to one place, but your money can go to five different places at that one time that you're going to one place. So it's very important to give in church as much as you can, as many times as you can. So that's what I wanted to share. That's a complete message, isn't it? She preached it better than me, right? You know, she just came with that anger and just walked to my office. Daddy, we need to preach this gospel fast before they spoil the gospel for us. 
That's exactly what she said. So I said, what happened? Then she told me the story and I felt like, you know what? We need to hear it from her directly because I can't say it like she said it. We need to get out there quickly. And even some of you in church, it's now you are recovering from those abuses and insults. Is that true? Some of you are just coming out of it. You can imagine many more that are there. Homes that have been broken, marriages destroyed, children damaged, lives shattered. You know, uh, we need to get this thing out very fast. And it shall be done. Amen. I didn't hear your amen. amen. Get out your offerings. Let's give in honor of Christ. All of you watching online, the off banking details are there. YouTube, Facebook, you know, I I Instagram. I don't want to call Twitter. <laughs> because Twitter has been, uh, I said nothing. I'd like you to get out your offerings. <laughs> we want to give in faith to the word. Praise God. I said, praise God. Lift up your offerings wherever you are. Father, we rejoice for the privilege to give all those watching around the world that are a part of our givings today. We ask that the blessing is upon their giving. Their finances are supernaturally released. The favor of God is upon them. Opportunities are made available to you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer sees a powerful amen. <laughs>